For so long, I've been in debate with myself, often questioning the many common misconceptions I've personally developed over the years concerning the girl crush concept. I once thought that it was somewhat outdated these days, especially as the market began to become a little oversaturated with it. Ever since 2NE1 popularized Girl Crush with their 2009 debut Fire, so many other groups have tried to follow in their footsteps to cash in on this bold and daring new thing that wasn't really a true K-pop staple at the time. And when I say that so many groups have tried, I mean so many groups have tried. Some have failed, others were moderate successes, and one group in particular has managed to thrive significantly. As the K-pop industry has gone through the motions and advanced through several generations of girl groups trying their hand with Girl Crush, it would all begin to induce a spell of public fatigue that would soon lead to many groups falling out of favor or never even being allowed to reach their full potential due to the stigma that has come to attach itself to Girl Crush for modern day consumers. Over the years, many have come to believe that so much of what initially popularized Girl Crush is now a bit too gimmicky. This whole I'm a bad bitch and you can't tell me what to do energy that often pervades so much of the lyricism within Girl Crush songs have led some to believe that Girl Crush just isn't as revolutionary as it once was. Believe it or not, there was once a time when Girl Crush was considered feminist, a bold and modern way to present your new girl group. This is likely because so many people enjoyed the fact that it was the polar opposite of the cute concept craze that groups like SNSD, A-Pink, and TWICE popularized. I myself made the mistake of overlooking TWICE during their rookie years, simply because I wasn't yet on board with the sugary sweet bubblegum pop flavor of their music at the time. I look back on those days now and question what I even had against them as a group, because it's not as if I thought their music was awful. A lot of it was super catchy and the members were very charismatic. Sana is one of my alt biases. Knock Knock is a song that I always put on anytime I need a mood lifter. And TT was and forever will be one of the most iconic K-pop songs in history. But back then, I just didn't think that I could ever personally vibe with their music. I have since changed my mind on what I initially thought about Twice, with their album Twicegram eventually becoming one of my all-time favorite K-pop albums. As I began to let go of my preconceived notions concerning their music, I remember wondering then, why didn't I vibe with their music back then? Why did it take me several years to jump aboard the once train? Well, shamefully, I think that a lot of my opinions were based around the opinions of others. Somewhere between the years of 2016 and 2018, K-pop would begin to globalize. Groups like BTS and Blackpink would soon open the door to the Western market for other groups, at a time when so many didn't even know that K-pop was a thing. With this grand influx of new fans coming in from outside of South Korea, I'm willing to bet that many K-pop companies sat up straighter in their chairs and begin to wonder how they too could profit from all of this sudden attention. But to do this, naturally, they would have to take a look at why so many of these Western fans were willing to open their wallets. They knew that their domestic fan base was eating up the cute concept, but Western fans were devouring Girl Crush. And I think that the reason why they were devouring the Girl Crush concept was an interesting one. Now I've spoken very briefly on this matter in other videos, but I'll try to expand upon it a bit more here. To many Western fans, TWICE just didn't hit as hard as Blackpink. And this, of course, is no shade to TWICE at all. As I've stated before, I love most of TWICE's music now and how they've evolved over the years. And some of their best songs were released when they were still doing cute concept. So this is no hate on their names. But for a vast majority of Western fans at the time, cute concept went against the grain of how they felt that women should be portrayed. And when I say Western fans, I mean Western female fans. I only place emphasis on female to clarify that the biggest demographic for Girl Crush is female, hence the name Girl Crush. This demographic likely loves Girl Crush because they see themselves in these idols with their sass and bad bitch girl boss energy. They love the glitz and glamour of Blackpink and the charismatic aura that's followed them since the very first moment they opened their mouths and said, Blackpink in your area. Blackpink has always exuded fierceness with their harder hitting music and the fact that they are four beautiful women who carry themselves with some effortless swagger 
That is an absolute necessity for any female idol following in the girl crush footsteps. To the Western female market in 2016, Cute Concept was the total opposite of girl crush in the worst way. It seemed to glorify the infantilization of women. I have personally had friends who've called it cringy, demoralizing, and even downright degrading. To them, seeing adult women make cute faces at the camera, dressed down in what they perceive to be children's clothes, while singing songs filled with saccharine lyrics about first love and high school crushes, just didn't appeal as much, and even somewhat pandered to the male gaze, since the biggest demographic for cute concept has more often than not been predominantly male. Westerners wanted their women to be presented as fierce, with a kick-ass, I'm independent and I don't need no man kind of energy. They wanted Destiny's Child or Fifth Harmony, and Blackpink was thematically the closest thing to that in K-pop at the time. So their appeal to the Western market and how they were able to blow up was no mystery. YG didn't have to do much to introduce Blackpink to the rest of the world because they already had everything necessary to introduce themselves. Now I have a completely different opinion on the matter regarding this undue hatred towards the cute concept, simply because I just don't understand why some people feel the need to define womanhood and the portrayal of womanhood in such a simplistic and watered down way. It's not a black and white issue to me personally. Women shouldn't be made to feel less empowered or embarrassed simply because they subscribe to more hyper-feminine attributes or ideals. There is more than one way to be a woman. But that's a different video for a different day, and I'm getting off topic, so I'll get off my soapbox now. Also, throughout this video, I'm only stating my viewpoint as an American, because obviously I can't accurately speak on how women are portrayed in other countries beyond America, because I don't live in those countries, and I don't want to risk spreading misinformation about shit that I have no actual insight on. However, I would be more than happy and willing to hear the opinions of people who live in other countries on this matter. Now, let me make it known that I am obviously exaggerating with my previous statement about Westerners and their aversion to cute concept, and I admit that it might even be somewhat of a generalization. After all, we're not some monolithic hive mind. Just because a minority of the American population believes something doesn't mean that they speak for everyone else and that includes me, of course. But the way that most of us form our opinions about the world around us is often due to the way the world is shown to us through the media. And the way that women are presented in the US media versus how they are presented in Asian pop culture is often simply due to cultural differences. What Westerners may perceive as infantilization, South Korea may see it differently. While many Westerners may feel as though Aegyo is cringy, South Korea has seen it as a cute way to display affection towards someone they like or love. And some Westerners' feelings about Aegyo might go hand in hand with how they feel about Q Concept. Aegyo, like Q Concept, could be seen as degrading to women, even somewhat perpetuating the typical stereotypes that are often attached to Asian women in general. The usual stereotypes of the typical Asian woman is that they are meek, subservient, and often far more soft-spoken than the stereotypical American female. This has likely influenced the way Cute Concept was created and how it's been packaged to suit the branding of different girl groups across generations. So while these common misconceptions attached to the Cute Concept turned away the Western market, this would make way for Girl Crush to rise, with Blackpink ready to lead the pack. As Girl Crush began to reign supreme and spread like wildfire, it would bring forth a new generation of girl groups with songs now filled with themes of female empowerment, no longer lamenting over high school crushes and first love. Now they were independent, strong, and telling everyone to get the fuck out of their way because they were queens and didn't care what anyone had to say about it. Okay, now here's the thing. I'm not trying to sound as if I'm talking shit about Girl Crush or anyone who listens to it. I still listen to it. I also sing Pretty Savage very loudly and very poorly at random when I'm alone in the car. So I would be a total hypocrite to even attempt to talk shit about Girl Crush because, in theory, I have nothing against the concept itself. I completely understand the idea of pushing these feministic themes towards the modern audience. Because yes, feminism is important. It's important for young girls to feel empowered 
especially in a world that sometimes makes it feel as though women don't deserve to love themselves. But unfortunately, the simplistic way that it's being pushed through the girl crush lens sometimes makes it feel disingenuous or as if it's pandering to the very audience that it's pretending to uplift. Maybe it's just me, but a lot of the lyrics in some of these songs don't feel as though they're actually empowering. They feel empty and lifeless. Sure, it's great to feel like a queen badass, but to say it out loud is kind of awkward, especially when you hear it in a song. When all of the lyrics in most of these songs follow the same pattern of I'm a big bad bitch and nobody can tell me what to do, it gets a little silly. After all, it's really hard to take a group's call to arms in favor of girl power seriously when it's usually men writing these songs. Especially when it sounds like these lyrics are simply telling us what they think we want to hear. But I digress. It's always wise to keep in mind that K-pop is a business and they are going to push their groups in the direction that they believe will bring in more money, even if it's at the detriment of their group's integrity and reputation sometimes. As I've watched so many groups debut and subsequently struggle to find their identity through Girl Crush, I remember wondering why Girl Crush, like its predecessor, the cute concept, has fallen so out of favor as of late. At this current point in time, any time a girl group debuts as Girl Crush, it's often considered by many to be yet another derivative retread following the same tired elements of every other Girl Crush song before it. But surely this can't be why Girl Crush has fallen out of favor over the years. There has to be a much deeper explanation than that, because Girl Crush is not the first concept to run its course and fall into a creative slump. There is nothing new under the sun. Every concept that we see in K-pop today has been done in the past by other groups and artists, so no one has really invented anything in this industry. Sure, some groups have managed to popularize or revive a concept, but no one has created anything. Then I realized that maybe it's not the girl crush concept that's fallen out of favor, but the way it's been executed. However, there is a light at the end of the tunnel here. Remember when I mentioned how some groups have managed to revive dead or dying concepts? Well, let's go into a bit more detail about that. Once often filled with empty choruses and lifeless lyrics, I think we're beginning to see a shift in how Girl Crush is currently being overhauled. We've slowly transitioned to an era of K-pop where women are back to being vulnerable and reminding us that self-love is indeed the best love. And this, you could argue, is another form of Girl Crush. Because Girl Crush, at its core, has always been more so about celebrating the female experience. It's been presented as a concept that allows women to appreciate themselves and each other in a way that doesn't sexualize or belittle their predecessors or their contemporaries. It's a concept that allows women to just enjoy being women. Or that's how the concept should be presented. Previous interpretations of the concept has always stuck to the usual checklist of what we've come to expect from it thus far. Decadent and nonsensical music videos, expensive clothes, and beautiful women telling us how much money they have or how great they are. Now don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with flaunting a little confidence. I have no problem with female idols singing about their successes and triumphs. My problem lies in how samey it all starts to feel when every group under the sun begins taking notes from each other. Then their producers or songwriters risk slipping into the usual pitfalls of basically repackaging the same song and dance over and over again. Modern renditions of Girl Crush has proven that you don't always need darker themes or edgier visuals to portray female empowerment. You don't need to tell us that you're a bad bitch to present us with a confident and intelligent woman who's developed a strong sense of self and decided to live life on her own terms. We've come to see that there are many ways to depict that general essence without coming off as a derivative parody. For example, female empowerment can come in the form of women boldly owning their sexuality, such as with idols nude. Or it can go softer and be portrayed in a way that allows women to speak about their vulnerabilities through a more relatable lens, such as how La Seraphim did with songs like Impurities or Good Parts. And it's not just through theme and lyricism that we've seen this evolution. We've now got brighter colors, sweeter vocals, and more self-love anthems. 
We've got women stepping up to the plate to pave their own way in the industry as competent songwriters, such as with groups like Purple Kiss and Kiss of Life. Hopefully, this push for female idols to take more creative control over their careers will become a trend, and we'll begin to see even more varying renditions of Girl Crush, hopefully with a more personal female touch that allows women to empower other women with their own words, rather than through the words of their male producers. Now, am I saying that men are no longer allowed to write Girl Crush songs for women? No. But what I am saying is that it would be nice to see more female idols get a say in what comes out of their mouths and how they are presented to the public. And by the way, I'm well aware that La Seraphim's impurities and good parts had male writers. So you might be thinking, well, doesn't that contradict your previous statements about male writers writing for women? Well, no, I don't think so. Because my previous statement was that male writers who write Girl Crush for women often tend to write the most shallow and derivative lyrics in songs, attempting to disguise themselves as feminist anthems. Songs like Impurities and Good Parts, despite having male writers, still manage to implement some form of sincerity with their lyricism in a way that makes it sound and feel more relatable, so that the songs don't feel like copy-paste retreads of other Girl Crush songs. In other words, the lyrics in these songs sound as if someone put some actual effort into conveying a different side of the typical girl crush message in a much more inspired way. The songs themselves don't just boast about wealth or accolades, but instead they attempt to remind the listener that it's normal to feel insecure and to acknowledge your flaws, whatever they may be, so long as you don't forget that despite these flaws, you are still worthy of love. This, I feel, is a much more realistic approach to the Girl Crush concept, and both of these songs have lyrics that almost anyone on the planet can relate to. Also, as far as I know, Yunjin and Sakura had some writing credits on these songs. Now, I don't know how much influence they had. Hell, they might have only written one word apiece, but the fact that they even had some input is still quite admirable, considering how uncommon it is for female idols to have any say on their music. And I know that there will likely be some people out there who say, sis, this ain't that deep. It's just pop music and you're taking it way too seriously. And to that I say, yes, you're right. It is just pop music and I will continue to listen to it and most likely enjoy it. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be allowed to ask for more effort from the institutions that wish to sell it to you. You can still be quite discerning about what messages you choose to take to heart from the music you listen to and how those messages make you feel about yourself. Thank you.